Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the public board meeting of April 30th, 2024 of the Board of Education here in Campbell River SD 72. Uh, we would like to acknowledge that this meeting is taking place on the traditional territories of the Liquido people and looking outside today at this beautiful, wonderful day here in Campbell River. I would personally like to thank them for their generational stewardship of these lands so that we may live, work and play here. Please note that there is a 10 to 30 second production delay between the live event that you are viewing and the meeting participants. The question and answer function is open online for questions on agenda items throughout this meeting and a call for final questions will be made after the last agenda item and the questions will be addressed at the end of the session. And this evening for my board chair remarks. I would like to share that on Friday, April 12th, uh, we, we attended a celebration at Ripple Rock Elementary as SD72 Campbell River opened its first new childcare facility. Gratitude to all who attended and the many staff who have invested and continue to invest much energy into ensuring the success of these facilities and are unique to the province staffing model. A number of trustees attended BCST AGM during the week of April 17th to 20th. Business session substantive motions reflected ongoing provincial concerns, including deteriorating infrastructure and new spaces for increased student growth, impacts to facilities and school populations when emergencies due to climate change occur, recruitment of education staff at all levels, especially in rural and northern districts, increased funding to meet the needs of vulnerable students, uh, the Universal Food Program and the announcements from the federal government, capturing student voice, equity, diversity, inclusion, anti-racism and anti-bullying um, uh, language, and finally childcare. Many of the topics covered within the business session were one that we here in SD72 Campbell River are challenged with. Um, with the motions that were approved, they will task our provincial representatives, the BCSTA, to build a guided work plan to advocate for and dis discuss concerns with government and cross-sectorial partners. As we turn the corner into the month of May, I wish to acknowledge May 5th, Red Dress Day. Red Dress Day is a nationally recognized day to remember, honour, show solidarity with and inspire action in support of missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls and 2SLGBTQQIA plus peoples across Canada. Please take a moment and reflect on how you might make a contribution to this important and long ignored crisis. Prior to our meeting this evening, I attended the public launching of the Campbell River Master Transportation Plan. Although I haven't spent much time with the document, I would like to highlight some proposed safety improvements to sidewalks around a number of our school sites, including the Cheviot Corridor to Ripple Rock. Thank you for listening. Thank you for our colleagues at the city for listening to our student safety concerns and we're looking forward to the improvements. And finally, as the warmer weather begins, one can feel the excitement in hallways and classrooms throughout the Campbell River School District. May and June will be filled with celebrations of students, staff and the completion of another successful year. I'm looking forward to all the events to come. Okay. On to Superintendent's remarks. Thank you, Board Chair Eddie. And uh, it's really hard to believe that tomorrow was May 1st already and as usual I'm going to tag team a little bit on to <laughs> your report uh, because uh, since our last board meeting uh, we opened the child care center at Ripple Rock but just on Monday we just opened the child care center um, at Ocean Grove and we have four others that are expected to open before the end of the school year that's at Pinecrest Elementary right next door Sandown Elementary Cedar Elementary and Georgia Park and then Quadra Island will have a child care center that will be open for the fall and start of the school year in 24-25. So it's just exciting to see all those changes happen and just wanted to note that uh, we we have gotten the attention of QP National and they uh, approached us at the BCSTA and wanted to thank us for our work with QP and, and how much support we've given them in terms of providing work for their educational assistance and uh, provided them a chance to have an eight hour day. So that did not go unnoticed and we actually uh, congratulated for that. So 
I wanted to make mention of that. Um, something that was postponed but now is eagerly anticipated is the careers evening that's going to be happening at NIC for students and their parents. It happens uh, May 8th uh, next week from 630 to 745 at North Island College. Uh, their uh, students and their parents can learn more about how to get a head start on their career paths. Uh, students can get a start on the university or apprenticeship program for free. Uh, they can overview. They will be overviewing various career programs such as university transfer, work experience, trades exploration and apprenticeship opportunities. So we're really looking forward to uh, that evening taking place and we hope to get lots of students and their parents out to, to learn a lot more about what that program has to offer. Um, also coming up shortly on Monday, uh, May 6th, it's a professional development day. It's a school based day, meaning that uh, all of our teachers uh, and uh, principals and educational assistants have the opportunity to take part in professional learning. Uh, just some of the things that are going to be occurring are uh, outdoor learning opportunities, secondary numeracy. There's an indigenous historical areas of interest tour by both. That's uh, one of the schools is also doing. Uh, EA workshops include play based learning, understanding behavior and inclusive education modules and online offerings. So we're looking forward to a great day of learning on Monday and uh, hearing how that went. So lots to look forward to and then there's two jam packed months to go and it's, it's going to be busy time. So thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Manning. Uh, on to agenda item number three, which is approval of the minutes of the meeting of April 9th, 2024. And the motion reads that the minutes of the meeting of April 9th, 2024 are hereby approved as circulated. Any discussion? Trustee Higgin, moving. Seconder? Uh, Dave, and all those in favor? Thank you. Is there any business arising from the minutes? Seeing on, seeing none, are there any additions or alterations to the agenda? Secretary Treasurer Patrick. Uh, I would like to add uh, next year's capital bylaw approval to 14C. Thank you. Any further additions or alterations to the agenda? Seeing none, uh, the agenda motion reads that the agenda is hereby um, approved as amended. Trustee Gillis, seconder, Trustee Hagan, all those in favor? And on to the report of board decisions from April 30th, 2024, confidential board meeting. Thank you, Trustee Eddie. Um, we discussed teaching administrative and support staff changes in property, legal, and financial issues. Thank you. Seeing no correspondence or public or agenda submissions. We are on to agenda item 11A, which is educational submissions. And I'd like to invite Brenna Ewing to the front for the in-reach outreach team report. Okay, good evening. Um, my name is Brenna Ewing. I'm the Director of Inclusive Education. And with me here, I have Erin Stevens, who is our uh, inclusion support teacher who leads our InReach outreach team. Um, so if, if you recall back to around this time last year when we were, um, when we were um, going through the budget consultation last year, one of the pieces that came out of the budget was that uh, reorganization to, at the time, what we call learning support services, which is now inclusive education. And um, one of those was the creation of our in-reach outreach team. So we thought now would be a good time, almost a year later and after implementing in September, just to do an update to the board on where we are at with that. So we'll just, okay. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, so what does the inReach outreach team do? Um, so it's ongoing um, group capacity building and in-service for case managers, learning support teacher, and school teams. 
which um, could include functional programming and assessment, data collection and in individualized supportive planning, programming for students with complex learning um, and behavioral needs, and then resource development, for example, visual tools, functional bins. Um, our initial plan was that we thought, like if we were looking at how much time would be to each thing, that you know, 50% of the time would be to consultation and collaboration, and then 25% uh, of the time to safety planning and 25% to tier three program, tier three programming. So this is our team this year. So on our team, we have myself. I'm the inclusion support lead teacher for the team. We have three inclusion support workers who were previous EAs in our district. Um, very skilled and wonderful um, and on this team. And we have one youth care worker as well on the team. Um, so what happens once a student is referred? Uh, so every Monday, the team meets to look at referrals that come in from schools. And based on the information received, um, we, the supports are prioritized to see like how that support would be. Um, given and then by whom. Uh, part of this process is, of course, connecting with the school team ahead of any supports being offered. This allows the team to see what supports the school already has in place or any considerations they need to be aware of um, in moving forward to support the school and the student. And then supports are then offered as in reach or outreach and sometimes both. So do you want to talk about that? We're going to talk about that. Okay, so the inreach component of our team um, happens on site at schools. So our myself as the inclusion support teacher and our inclusion support workers, or ISWs for short, um, we will go to the school, we'll collaborate with the team there um, to develop programs to support students and the school teams. Um, it looks a variety of different ways. It could be that we're doing direct service with a student and their team on the school site. Uh, could be that we are capacity building for support staff for teachers, especially if we've got new EAs or new teachers to the building. Uh, we do program development if that's what's needed. Uh, we support with developing elopement or regulation support plans. So we've got protocols around those and implementing those and working with the teams to develop them. Um, and then we do meet with families and caregivers um, whenever possible. That's the in reach part. And the outreach part of our program happens at Rob Ron. So we have students attending uh, three days a week for two hours per day. Uh, right now we have two different groups that we run. We have one early primary group um, that comes in our mornings and then one intermediate group that comes in the afternoon. So there are usually anywhere between four to six students per cycle of support. Um, and some students will be referred for more than one cycle. Um, our students will come. We're really meeting them where they're at when they're coming to our outreach component at the school site at Rob Run. So we, what we're really doing is saying, well, they can come for the cycle, but if we're noticing that they're demonstrating a lot of growth and we feel like it's time for them to transition back into the school a little bit early, we sort of leave that wide open so that we're meeting the students where they're at and meeting their needs. Um, so this group is targeted intervention to support students to build class school and classroom readiness by building relationships, um, developing strategies to self regulate, uh, working on social skills development and following those expected routines and transitions that will help them when they get back into that larger environment of the school setting. Um, and the youth care worker outreach. Um, so the youth care worker outreach services are for students who are not attending school at all or who exhibit other significant barriers to full time attendance at school and opportunities through outreach for this portion are highly individualized and re require ongoing collaboration um, with the school team and ongoing case management is the responsibility of the school team. And in the later slide, I'm going to talk about some step next steps around this piece based on some of the data that's come forward as a result of the referrals for this part of our team. Um, so mid-year data. So uh, just at this point in the, in the year, you can see um, the number of students that have been receiving supports. Uh, so in reach 56, uh, outreach 14, uh, the youth care worker outreach 35, and then students who might have received multiple um, supports 22. And then uh, we have to segregate the data to um, 
into our seeing how many of our Indigenous students across the district are receiving support. And we did share this information um, on our inmate <laughs> with our Indigenous Advisory Council. So we did want to make sure we had broken that data down. And so you can see um, how that's broken down across the district. So part of the learning and growing um, that we are wanting to do with this team this year, and there's been a lot of learning and growing with this team this year for sure. Uh, we did develop um, a survey that we sent out to sort of any school teams that have worked with us either in reach outreach uh, with Bridget or Youth Care Worker Support. Um, so this is just some of the feedback that we got from the schools. Um, <laughs> You know, one of the schools said that we they appreciated the opportunity for direct support for two complex classrooms and to spread the workload to support the teacher. It was also an opportunity for families to develop a positive connection with an SD72 staff member. So sometimes when we've got our kiddos having a really hard time, they said, you know, a bit of a role between families and, and staff. So that was that was made us feel great. Uh, having students be given the opportunity to focus explicitly on social emotional learning skills without the distraction of the rest of the classroom. So the environment that we've created at Rob Ron, is there a picture here? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, we've, we've really worked to create a, a safe environment for them um, where we can meet their sensory needs um, and then not have all the other things going on that is maybe making it difficult for them throughout their day. So um, another uh, School district uh, staff members said the space and time that is available at inreach outreach is so valuable for students who can practice these skills in a safe supportive environment before returning to the classroom uh, the personalized support to help high need students gain school ready skills also some new strategies for myself and our staff so that goes back to that capacity building that we were talking about before um, and this program has been highly valuable and i am so grateful for it it has allowed us for us to better program for our students' needs. I wish there were more of you in the district. <laughs> yeah, and maybe, I mean, just last week at, we had our um, SLT meeting with the uh, principals and vice principals, and one of the vice principals stopped and shared, said to me, uh, you know, I just wanted to say, like, thank you to, to um, the, include the team because I've never felt so supported um, um, in helping with a student in my classroom who was experiencing some personal difficulties and um, said I've never felt so supported. Maybe, and this is maybe an opportunity to publicly thank Erin, because I know you know you always say you're successful as the people you have on the team, and this team is being led by Erin. I mean, a, a piece of the success is Erin and those team members are um, skilled, um, flexible, open, um, creating those relationships with families and staff. And I think, yeah, the, the work that that team is doing is uh, I, I think the feedback is wonderful. And of course, we also the feedback that we get throughout are some of the changes that we make or have to be flexible too. Um, we, we take that on too. The team is always uh, once a week um, reflecting. They have a team meeting uh, once a week where they're, they're reflecting, planning the next week. What do we have to do differently? Like it's always, um, again, like based on student need and um, designing programs accordingly. So yeah, thank you. Sure. The work you've done. We've made many notes to self as we went along. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so some of our next um, next steps. So uh, what we found out fairly quickly was that our referrals for non-attenders highlighted the need we have in this particular area across the district. Um, so currently uh, we are working uh, with our school teams and why we, I should say, um, Alyssa, Bolland, our um, district principal of inclusive education that was hired on this year, has taken on this work with our youth care workers. So the addition of Alyssa has really enabled the enhancement of this work because um, she's now working with youth care workers to develop some uh, processes, processes and policies that are also in collaboration with schools to create those systems and structures within our schools to better support students and find out what barriers are keeping them from attending and really um, uh, being um, very intentional and very focused and very supportive on, on this piece and to families and students. So um, that's gonna be continued work into next year. Uh, we are working with community partners to create systems that will reduce barriers for our most vulnerable to be able to access supports, uh, looking at the creation uh, with our uh, district counselor and then 
with our youth care workers and creating a team that is going to be um, more specifically focused on non-attenders and some of our, um, that's the one at the bottom, some of our in-risk students that need um, support. Uh, we will be sending a survey out from our department uh, just to gain more information from students, families, and our partner groups. Uh, so we might be able to see what areas we're missing. And then just like I, I spoke about here, so our youth care, the outreach team to better support those students who are currently not attending due to those in-risk behaviors, such as substance use or mental health. And this is going to include the work of our new district council counselor that we were able to hire this year. And so that is going to be a small team, an offshoot of this team that will support um, those students too that are referred and to have again those structure, structures and processes um, in schools too, too. So it's very clear what um, needs to happen at a school level and then when referrals come to a district level and how we work together to support those students. Mm. Okay, so any questions or comment? Thank you. Um, this sounds wonderful. It, it has a feel of being very organic and very uh, responsive, very intuitive with a lot of scale based um, practice as well. I'm wondering how will you measure success? What you know? What will you be bringing to us to say? See how well this works. We need more. Um, one. I mean, one of the pieces. I said again, we're trying to triangulate the data. So I mean, some of it is anecdotal, observational, and then one of the pieces and um, is we're. I mean, we're keeping track of some of like our challenging behavior reports that come in or other safety related incidents that come in and see if like we have a decrease in those mm -hmm. over time. So like we are trying to triangulate that data to be able to share those pieces. But yeah, anecdotally, we're feeling like um, there's some, definitely some successes. And then, yeah, like we've highlighted, there's some pieces that we're going to attend to so we can enhance it even more. But yeah, we're, we're keeping track of those data points. Great. We also have some of our students that are on partial day programs right now for safety reasons or so on and so forth. So we're looking at, at mm. data tracking like their increase in time to yeah. be at school. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. Other ones. Yeah. 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 Trustee Hagen, followed by Trustee Gladish. Yeah, I was just wondering as a board, uh, how is it that we can be supporting you in uh, some kind of concrete fashion? Um, well, I think you have support. That's going to be concrete. Well, that's a good answer. <laughs> yeah. That's the right answer. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. the approval, like through the process last year, the approval mm -hmm. of um, bringing this team on with the organization yeah. is um, your yeah is your support of what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. right. So yeah, continuing on with that is great. Just a flash. Sounds amazing what you're doing. Um, just wondering, is it kind of a, a revolving door sort of thing? Do you have students who sort of come in and they're with you just for a month or two or something and then they leave and you take in another? How does that work? Yep, that's pretty much exactly how it works. Mm -hmm. So we have, like I said earlier, we have students and we're just meeting them where, we, where they're at. Mm -hmm. So we've had some that have come in for sort of, we've offered them a six week um, cycle of support, of intervention mm -hmm. support, and that week three, week four, they're good to go and we work with the school team and we transition them back back to their school and then other kiddos we've had that have come for the full six weeks of support and while they've demonstrated some improvement and some growth they're maybe not quite ready to go back to their school full time but we still want them to be doing school as much as we can so they come back to us for another cycle. So it is just a lot of data tracking yeah. Um, as we go along and saying, OK, this is this is where we're at and we think we're going to try and, and work with the school team to, to get them back into school. And maybe that's a piece if, if it was highlighted through here, like the one piece is that transitioning back to school or really working closely with the school team is it's not a parachute back in. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a careful collaboration with that school team and the classroom teacher to like you know, mm -hmm. with documented these are the strategies that are working. And so it's like Let's make sure that that is consistent as we move back into the classroom. So what we have found through this is there's a lot of natural capacity building that happens, um, you know, across all um, employee groups in our district. We would say based on the 
conversations and what we're learning about um, behavior or, um, you know, looking at this tr through the trauma-informed lens mm -hmm. and that behavior is a form of communication, all those pieces that, that we believe in. Um, so, yeah, we find that there is also that collaboration allows for a lot of capacity building and, and feedback and reflection. So, yeah. Sounds good. Capacity building for the kids and the teachers. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Skipper. Yeah. Mr. Gillis. We just returned from the uh, AGM of the BC schools uh, <clears throat> trustees and one of the speakers talked about creating hope. And I really feel that you've mm -hmm. done that, I'm sure, for students and, and for families. And Aaron, a question, and it might be a, an unfair one, you can pass on it, but what, what's something that has really surprised you that you've learned or something that's really been gratifying in your journey in this new role? Well, I get surprised on a daily basis <laughs> <laughs> um, by some of the things that happen, for sure. I'm both pleasantly surprised and sometimes alarmingly surprised, um, but that's sort of the nature of what we're doing, I think. Um, I think when you're working with some of the most vulnerable kids that we have and they come to us to rob run for outreach and we just bring the joy and it's yes. good times and we see the success for them there and it's a different environment in the classroom setting and we completely recognize that but but taking them into that environment and working with them there and like i said bringing the joy showing them the love and, and working on things and then then transitioning them back to school and seeing those same sorts of things happen for them <coughs> in the classroom setting again it has really been it's been a wonderful it's been wonderful for all of us and i can't speak for the team of course but I know it's something that we debrief about all the time. How can well, we how can we see that happen for our next kiddo? Please let your team know how appreciative we are. Well, thank, thank you. Trustee mm -hmm. Britt? Sounds great. Uh, quick question. Just wondering what the grade breakdown is. Uh, so um the grade breakdown for the like coming for support at Robron is uh K to five at this mm -hmm. point, but the um in reach into schools is up to like our elementary and middle schools and a little bit in our secondary schools, but probably more so right now focusing on elementary middle, like if, if there are referrals that come from secondary, but we also introduced um, an inclusion support teacher to our secondary schools this year. That was one of the other budget um, considerations that we were able to put forward last year. And so that's made a difference at our secondary schools as well. So they also have a bit more um, built in support. Um, with with an inclusion support teacher this year as well. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so I just wanted to share that this the ability to put this team in place came about in a kind of a unique way. So the question about how did the board support uh, this is our special education numbers have been going up very, very rapidly. I believe when I checked it was like 40% level twos and like 30% level threes over the last five years. But after COVID, they went up really large in one year. And the uh, so that meant funding also went up. And traditionally, we would just incrementally increase everything, just make it a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. But for this year, we, because it was such a large amount, um, we actually separated it from the operating budget portion. So in theory, what the board could have chose to do is to actually take this money and redistribute it into other ways after the incremental increases. But early in the budget year, uh, we started talking about in-reach outreach, which really preserved that increase. Uh, which allowed that large amount to be applied. It was almost a million dollars. Uh, and it allowed really a brave step, a big, bold, brave step to be done to try something different and to make a large impact rather than tinkering, rather than incremental support. So again, the board support was in supporting that decision because the board could have taken the, the, the remainder and put it into other things. So. Um, yeah, so it was a unique situation. I'm not sure we will see or have the ability to do that again. Um, so it is, again, very, uh, very rare and very special that we were able to do this. 
And, and I think one of the like the in reach outreach was one of those pieces, but we were able to increase like all associated professionals across the inclusive education department. That's the inclusion support teacher at secondary. Um, off the top of my head, I think there was another youth care worker. So was there mental health? Um, that district well, counselor, yeah, which we weren't yeah. able to hire last year, just based what we are able to hire this year. So that's exciting. So yeah, we were able. So there was a number of supports for students that we were able to put in place based on that. So. Mm -hmm. Right. And are you finding uptakes from specific schools kind of more regularly than across the district as a whole? Like, do you get more engagement from specific schools? I'm not asking you to name them, but quite a few schools. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think it, maybe at the beginning, until when people were just, you know, it was new and people were understanding it. And then I think those schools quickly understood mm -hmm. what the support they were getting and they got on board. And then it, it expanded from there. And I would say it's pretty even across um, schools. Like I don't think there there's not as like many there's not much outreach. Yeah, like one of the two is pretty even. Yeah, yeah, and there's not a school. There's not an elementary school that we have. I don't think there's a school that we haven't visited at all. So, we could break it down into specific school sites. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, just interesting. Thank you so much for your work and thank you for your commitment to an innovative model. Um, and we're hoping that we can continue to support, but thank you for the work that you've done this year and hopefully coming into next year and supporting our students. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to say that one. Yeah, that's a clear. Stop skipping so on to electorate and board matters and um, Vice Chair Gillis will give us an update on the BC School Trustees Association AGM. Well, I am so jazzed up and excited. Uh, we had an opportunity to meet with about close to 300 school trustees and um, superintendents and secretary treasurers and as you alluded to earlier, there was a wonderful QP reception one evening. I thought it was held just for us because we'd opened the child care centers, but <laughs> we were rock stars throughout the province. People wanted to talk to us. If you said Campbell River, it was like the golden ticket. So <laughs> it was what I, I just want to mention um, three things here and uh, certainly invite others to, to speak. But uh, one of the, I think, important pieces is to hear inspirational leaders. And one of the plenary sessions, it was Riaz Meggy, who um, is a TV personality. And he talked about the power of human connections. And I think what we just heard in this recent presentation exemplifies how important that is. And he talked about connection, uh, people needing to know whether you're an adult or a student, do you care about me? Are you listening to me? And he gave us some sage advice. So he said, ask first and talk second. And that too often in our agenda driven lives that we um, we forget to do the listening part. We're so eager to share our story, but exploring the stories um, and not just the answers is really a greater key to kind of providing a culture. Um, he also talked about, you know, just that whole idea of, of us um, looking back in our own lives at what's really been significant. And he had a little exercise for us where we were to recount with a partner a conversation that we had had that made a real difference in our lives. And sometimes people talked about, you know, a mentor or a family member or whatever. And then he asked us to, uh, what are, what's the most important conversation you've never had? So the fact that sometimes we steer away from those conversations, those harder conversations, but those can, can bring about a lot of learning and understanding for us. So um, he said, make people feel famous. <laughs> okay, practice specificity specificity in other words when you're thanking someone you're, or you're con you're saying wow you did a great job be really specific about what it was that you noticed um uh, find a way to celebrate your champions and i believe we do that in our school district i believe through our um you know our retirements and our long service we do celebrate the champions who serve students um the second one i just wanted to talk to um uh, 
There was a group of nine students from Britannia Secondary with their teacher. I've forgotten his first name, but he is at Chenoweth. Matt. And Matt. Matt too. Yeah. And they were just, they just blew us away. They, I, I wish we'd had more time to ask them some questions after, but they feel so embraced, welcome, supported by their school. And, and the why is that they feel that they can celebrate their culture, their heritage, their language, um, their indigenous nation, their roots. Um, and, and it just really came through and all aspiring to having some really um, exciting futures. So, and then finally, I just wanted to talk about because Chair Eddie has led us through um, a crafting of our work plan. So I went to a session on how to, how to, how to build your, your trustee work plan. And really it was make sure that the things that you deem important to student achievement, to the goals that you've set through your strategic plan have got very specific moments within your year. And so that you can look at both what you are hoping to achieve and how you're gonna be able to measure that. So um, those are just a few. I could go on and on and on, but um, I, it was really a privilege to be in the company of other trustees, specifically at, um, and senior management from our own district in, uh, in a great uh, forum. So anyone else like to come in? Contribute to. I feel like okay. you did a great job, Vice Chair Gilbus. Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't mind. Oh, yeah, sorry. Please. Just to follow up on what you said about those uh, those high school students yeah. from Britannia, um, two things they said uh, that uh, would be really helpful for them. Um, one would be for them to have more opportunities to explore and learn about their indigeneity, who they are. You know what came before them, what's in front of them, and what's what lies ahead for them. And the second thing they said was for their teachers to be more informed yes. about who we are as Indigenous people in this yeah. world. And and again, where we came from, where we are, what we're, you know what we're doing. Yeah. So I thought those were really informative. And I thought of anything that would be great takeaways for anybody who is at the front of the classroom or around a table like this. Thank you for that opportunity to share that. Thank you, Trustee Gladish. Um, there are no educational issues on the agenda. Moving on to 14A, which is the finance warrant in its new form. <laughs> well done. Please uh, thank the accounting department because it is a much easier document to engage with. And I understand it's a little bit easier yeah, for yeah. preparation as well. Um, so we do have finance warrant number nine dated March 30 for the for the month of March 31st, 2024. And the motion to approve it reads that the finance warrant number nine dated March 31st, 2024 be accepted as presented. Trustee Hagan and Trustee Harper, all those in favor? Thank you. And on to the quarterly finance report for the period ending, ending March 31st, 24. Um, Hi, so this is sharing and it is good for me to, to continue. Or to use. Uh, so yeah, Q3, so there's some good news in this uh, third quarter, but there's some um, Uh, okay, so this is the third quarter up to March, and um, the first thing that I just want to point out, this little line right there, um, it is, uh, it has a note that we're in a structural deficit in the current year, but we're not. So that was left over from a uh, previous quarter. Um, you'll show as we go about this. So this is the final budget that was passed in February. Uh, so we're, we're um, got all of our actual revenues in, our actual expenses that we expect to carry to the end of the year, and this is the first update for that. So that structural deficit, we're going to take that off because we're not. Uh, we actually are projecting a surplus this year, and some of the um, some of the numbers in here will actually show 
that would probably will end up even even better. Um, so here's what I'll just show you. So we're projecting our revenues for this final budget of this year at seven three three million eight thirty three, and you can see that the total expenses are a little bit less. So that's technically a structural surplus. Um, so we are in a fairly good financial position. Now, when we do the quarterly budget, we try to figure out what what um, uh, the third quarter budget to date would be. And you can see that we were projecting a deficit at this time uh, of about half a million dollars. <laughs> but an actual, as of today, we're about $75,000 deficit. So some of that is due to the timing issues. Um, the ministry grants kind of come in slow over summer and then speed up throughout the rest of the year. Uh, as well as some of these items here, um, when we get to the expense page, you can actually see our supplies are way overspent what we would expect. A lot of the supplies are paid, one-time payments are they're paid in the summer for the year. Uh, and we aren't able to adjust our year to date for that. We just put it all in. Uh, so that overspend will reduce, yet we will expect to see our um, uh, revenues compared to the actual budget, uh, the full year budget I should go up. Uh, so that is, um, is some really good news. Um, I will, so I pointed out the supply issue, um, and that is the timing, uh, I think. <laughs> because of when the items are purchased. Now on this screen, so we got a couple things that I want to touch on. Uh, the QP line, it actually is showing quite underspent. Now part of that reason is that we typically understand and usually the reason is going to be unfilled positions. That's partially true. One of the things that we realized when building the budget that we're going to work on to bring to you to pass yeah. next year is in that QP budget, there actually were some positions that weren't there. Was, we budgeted for some positions that weren't supposed to be there. So uh, when it came to our EA formulas, um, we had a school where the number of EAs wasn't usually gets adjusted but it wasn't adjusted for this current year we've adjusted it for next year uh, but when we did that of course it all highlighted and it explained the variance of why we're this year quite under for for qp wages um and then kind of coming down i'll speak to operations and maintenance uh so professional staff is over um, and the QP staff is under. Um, some of that is some of the, we do have an unfilled position in there where we do have a, um, a retired manager who is doing some work for us and they're being recorded in. So some of that budget is sliding, uh, sliding up. The, um, but there are, There also is a bit of a timing issue with that. So when it comes to QPs and operations staff, we have some that work 12 months and then we have bus. Well, we have some that work 10 months. Uh, so when we get to the end of the year, we do expect that gap to uh, to reduce a little bit. Another item that causes that QP wage to be lower is we do we have something called a chargeback. So when we do a project and they, uh, there's another source of revenue for it. Um, we will bill out our QB at trades time. And when we receive that, we will book it in and actually reduce their wages. So that is so it's part of it. By the end of the year, what I expect is professional staff, um, child care manager will likely be allocating some of that out back to the project. I think some of it's still in there. Uh, some of the chargeback items, uh, we have some individuals that are being quoted to AFG. Some of that will get sorted out, and we will see those numbers narrow a little bit, quite a bit. Um, so that's really kind of the items that I wanted to point out. So the overall message is good news. Um, we're half a million dollars under where we expected to be at this point. 
We were already projecting about a two to three hundred thousand dollar surplus. By the end of the year, we will probably be larger uh, surplus than that. Um, and uh, so it will help our board get to <coughs> rebuilding the surplus as, as um, the board policy uh, looks for. So it's kind of a, a soft expectation that uh, um, contingency preserves 2% of, um, of revenues. Uh, but it's a slow build. Uh, the board doesn't want to budget that. But at the end of this year, we will be able to contribute to that as well as potentially address some other one time things. Why I think this is really important is right now a lot of school districts are in tough, tough financial conditions. So we're preparing for next year. I know that many districts are in deficits and they're cutting. We're in a fortunate position where we're adding. If you combine that with the financial position where we'll end this year, it should put the board in a good position for next year. But the uh, challenges that are facing every other school district <coughs> will face us as well in the future. So we'll have to be somewhat cautious. But again, this is a, a good message right now. So any questions about finances? I, I, I just wanted to say living in the moment, having just come back from the uh, AGM, we bear out the story that you're repeating that there are many districts who are struggling and it did make us again feel very fortunate to be in the position that we are in. So thank you. I am also comforted by the fact that we can start to look towards rebuilding our surplus as it took such a huge hit um, due to the unexpected costs associated with COVID um, and not having that safety net is a bit worrisome because, of course, if we can't balance our budget, we must balance it by cutting programs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, on to, sorry, I've lost my agenda here. Yeah. On to um, the, uh, on to the added agenda item of the uh, next year's capital plan. late uh, to the agenda. Hopefully it's in your package and you also received uh, electronic copy. Um, so we received approval for a certain number of projects that I'll, I'll speak to. Uh, we got $900,000 for the Sayward roofing upgrade. Uh, the next item, $400,000 for roofing upgrades. This is actually for fall protection for safety. Mm. So this is huge because this will impact all of our schools and we're going to get going. Not totally sure this will do everything in every school, but uh, it is a much needed uh, safety upgrade that we'll be able to do. Uh, we're, we kind of took it and put it at the top of our priority for this last submission and we're really happy that we received it. Uh, Sandown HVAC upgrade. Um, so, and these are the types of things that are a positive because it'll provide a better climate controlled uh, experience for students, but it also saves us money because it's more efficient uh, equipment. And then the last one, uh, it is a playground, but it's embargoed. Mm. So I can't share it because it's embargoed. Uh, and we've been asked specifically not to publicly announce it. So we did receive some funding for a playground. Of course, you can see it, but we can't share it out. And so by approving this bylaw, we'll start to get access to the money to start funding these projects, so. Thank you. So begins the um, reading of the capital plan bylaw. So um, the first motion is that the capital plan bylaw number 2024-25 CPSD 72-01 for projects identified in the March 15, 2024 Capital Plan response letter from the Ministry of Education and Child Care be given all three readings at this meeting. So may I have a uh, mover? Trustee Gillis, Trustee Harper, all those in favor? We do have the unanimous vote that we require to move forward with all three readings. And so the readings begin. That the Capital Plan Bylaw Number 2024-25 CPSD 72-01 for projects identified in the March 15, 2024 Capital Plan Response Letter from the Ministry of Education and Child Care is hereby read for the first time. May I have a mover? Trustee Hagen. Seconded by Trustee Gladish. All those in favor? 
Second reading that the capital plan bylaw number 202425 CPSD 72 01 for projects identified in the March 15, 2024 capital plan response letter from the Ministry of Education and Child Care is hereby read for the second. Trustee Hagan, Trustee McMahon, all those in favor? And finally, that the capital plan bylaw number 202425 CPSD 72 01. For projects identified in the March 15, 2024 capital plan response letter from the Ministry of Education and Child Care is hereby read for the third time, passed and adopted. Trustee Briggs, Trustee Gillis, all those in favor? So moved. Thank you, um, Kevin, and to our um, Public <coughs> Works Department for gathering together all that information. Mm -hmm. And we look forward to the work being completed over the 24 25 school year. And the announcement for the playground. Mm -hmm. Because some school is going to be very happy. Yes, they will be. So um, on to committee reports. So we have an April 15th meeting of the Core Professional Development Committee. Trustee Gladish. Okay, um, so the Core Prodi Committee uh, met and there was a lot of discussion about um, what Prodi will look like in 20. 2024 and 25 with regard to a day of Indigenous learning, some school based and district pro D, um, some discussion about the strategic plan and the learning goals that are inherent within that document and how it looks in schools. Um, talked about collaboration time and the possibility of uh, looking at the funding structure to include teachers who are hired after September 30th and to make sure that they have the kind of pro D that would help them being most of them are brand new teachers and also ways to include TTOCs in professional development with the idea that they will eventually join us as full time employees. Um, in essence, to, to make access to pro D more accessible for everyone. Um, there was also discussion about themes for the 20, uh, 24, 25 school year in terms of I don't know, assessment, literacy, numeracy, all those important things that are included in our strategic plan. Um, so those were some really good uh, discussions. Equity was a thread that came out through all the discussions and uh, a great bunch of people, uh, teachers and, and uh, super, um, administrators who are really committed to professional development. So it was a good meeting. Thank you very much, Trustee Gladish. I um I just want to highlight the theme around the funding model and some of the disparities for both professional development and enrollment in some of our more urban districts across the province um, and how the funding model September 30th cutoff date doesn't necessarily meet the needs. Right. And on to committee reports from uh, the District Parent Advisory Committee, Trustee McMahon. Thank you. Yes, um, I think the main item on their meeting uh, this past week was uh, Secretary Treasurer's uh, presentation of the budget and uh, request for some kind of feedback, some thoughts. So I think there was good conversation. Mm -hmm. um, they always seem like a very reasonable group of small, but very reasonable in terms of their their uh, motivation to understand how the district operates and how mm -hmm. um, you know their ideas might contribute to that. The other piece they are planning have been for some time and I'm hopeful they'll be able to pull it off, but they want an event that not only um, kind of promotes the role of PAC and DPAC in the community, but also supports a better awareness of what the role of trustees and the board is, and to some degree, senior management. So they have an idea that they would sometime this coming month, they would like to have an event that calls people, parents, families together for an evening, and I think they're hoping to feed them and they're going to ask you to come and have some words of wisdom. It's we're we're kind of in wait and see mode, but they're a lovely group of people. I like I like spending time with them. Mm -hmm. 
Trustee Hagan. Yeah, I just have a question. Uh, what was the response to the uh, to the budget, uh, seeing that we actually, for once, uh, are saying that we have some extra money and that we can we're not going to be shaving something off their program? What did they say to that? Um, well, they were, you know, they didn't have a long list of things, but they were thoughtful. I think Secretary Treasurer w was taking notes about it. Um, they uh, are really concerned about mental health and wellness mm -hmm. and looking for ways to kind of, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Trustee McMahon. And um, I'm looking forward to potentially being invited to have. Yes, stay tuned. Yeah. Excellent. And uh, with a little bit of feedback, maybe we can pull some other trustees in as well. It would be a great yes, opportunity mm -hmm. to show DPAC our support and their important role within our school community. <laughs> so um, seeing no other business, are there questions for anyone? Um, on agenda items for this meeting. Yes, we've had two questions that have come in online, both of which are from Andrea Craddock, QP 723 president. The first question is about the in-reach outreach uh, presentation. The question uh, reads, the in-reach outreach team has been well received by support staff working with students with complex needs. However, there is a long wait list sometimes months for staff and students waiting for space for them in the program. How will the program address the wait times for students and the staff trying to manage student programs? Is there an opportunity for other resources to go into the schools that are waiting? I, I would say, you know, with, with the in-reach outreach team will be analyzing how the program works, how it operates. They're probably going to be giving a survey to all the schools to ask, how did this work for you? What are your suggestions for further supports? And in terms of ongoing support at a district level, we're always looking at that. Uh, in any any capacity we have to add additional supports, we are always trying to, to do it. But more specifically, that's a question probably for uh, Director Yang and her team. Mm -hmm. The other question that came in, um, again from Andrea Craddock, uh, QP Local 723 President, was about the quarterly finance report uh, presented by Secretary Treasurer Patrick. The question reads, it's concerning to see QP instruction funding underspent as we remain critically short education assistance. What is the district doing to continue to address this shortage? Well, if I may, uh, you know, we are constantly advertising uh, we are constantly interviewing. We are constantly trying to get more educational assistance uh, in our school district, and, and we have gone to the extra measure now of adding a responsible adult uh, job description and posting in our school district. Uh, that's another way to get support. So we're always looking. I don't know if Secretary Treasurer Packer has anything to add to that, but, and, or Associate Superintendent Sismic, but. I think it's a priority for us always. And I think it's a priority for every school district uh, that I'm aware of because all of my colleagues tell me the same story. They can't get enough educational assistance. If I may, we did have a discussion regarding the responsible adult um, job posting and knowing that QP and senior leadership have been working really, really seamlessly together to try to make this position more viable applicable to the in-school based teams. Um, I think it's an excellent opportunity to gather non-EAs into our school community and present them with opportunities for further training and inspiration to become a licensed EA so that we can recruit, recruit internally and continue to refresh our EA base as we move forward. Thank you. Those are the only questions that have come in online. Thank you very much. So seeing no further questions, uh, may I please have a motion for adjournment? Trustee Hagen. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.